Nowhere in my travels, not in the heart of the Imperium, nor the streets of Orzammar, have I felt so much an outsider as in Ravain. The chant of light never truly reached the ears of these people. The years they spent under the thumb of the Kunari left most of the country zealous followers of the Kuhn. But resistance to the chant goes deeper than the Kunari War. The Riveni refuse to be parted from their seers, wise women who are in fact hedge mages, communicating with spirits and actually allowing themselves to become possessed. The Chantry prohibition against such magical practices violates millennia of local tradition. Hello again, my dear students, and welcome back to another exciting lesson of Dragon Age, the history and lore of Thedas, with me, Professor Absalom. In this lesson, we are going to take a closer look at the Thedosian nation of Rivain, famed for its mystical seers, unique culture, and vicious raiders. So grab your notebook and your pirate hat, and we will start the lesson. Located in the northeastern corner of the continent, Ravain is almost completely surrounded by water, with the exception for a large land bridge that connects the country to the neighboring nation of Antiva, and the rest of Thedas as well. The Ravaini Peninsula is bordered by the large Rialto Bay and the island of Lomarin to the south, the Venediction Sea to the northwest, the Kunari island of Parvolan to the north, with the northern passage in between, and the grand expanse of the Amaranthine Ocean to the east. With a hotter climate typical of northern Thedas, Ravain has a long mountain range along the east coast of the nation, and is home to five major cities and settlements. The coastal cities of Afsana and Aisley, as well as the capital of Dersmoid in the south, and the settlement of Sere in the north. Northern Ravain is also home to the only peaceful enclave of the Kunari on the main continent, namely the port city of Kont Ar. The people of Ravain are known as Ravaini. The Ravaini, appearance wise, vary in skin colors from a dark tan all the way to ebony. The nation of Ravain differs in many ways from the other countries of the continent in large part due to its unique culture and customs. Aside from the religious conflicts, which I will get to, the Ravaini are historically a tribal people, and many still honor the old tribal traditions of the past. One of these is the belief that women, especially older women, are better suited for rulership and positions of leadership than men. This matriarchal system not only applies to Ravaini communities overall, who are almost always led by the elder women of the group, but also the ruling of the nation itself, as the Kingdom of Ravain is led by a queen, and is most likely a matrilineal primogeniture. A social marker that is quite unique to the Ravaini, in comparison to other Thedosians, is that of jewelry, body piercings, and tattoos. Aside from the aesthetic value, which many Ravaini appreciate, Piercings and tattoos also displays one's social rank and status in Ravain. The more intricate and valuable ornaments a person has, the higher rank in society this person also has. The Ravaini seers are some of the most important women in their society, with both the seers and the Ravaini's overall special relationship to magic a subject of great importance. The people of Ravain have an overall more accepting and relaxed attitude towards magic and its practitioners, at least in the more traditional Ravaini communities. This is in no small part due to the Seers. The Seers are, as mentioned, the most influential of Ravain's wise women, and are free to practice and use magic as they see fit. It is customary for female mages to be apprenticed to older seers and trained in the traditional ways so that they may become seers themselves. Communicating with the spirits of the Fade is something of a speciality for the Ravaini seers, and they may even go so far as to willingly letting themselves be possessed to achieve different arcane purposes, 
or binding the spirits to them and their will. Seers also traditionally engage in a wide variety of magical crafting, making popular fertility amulets for Aveni women, as well as several magical binding amulets to protect summoned spirits from forced bindings and actions from rival mages. One of the more powerful of these talismans that a seer can create is called an Amulet of the Unbound, which supposedly makes summoned spirits immune to blood magic and binding. Twice a year, all the seers of Ravain meet in the capital of Deresmoid for an event known as the All's Meet. Here, they hold counsel amongst themselves on matters of import as well as publicly pledging themselves to the service of the ruling queen of Ravain. Deals struck or made during the All's Meet is considered particularly auspicious, hence why many seers forge trade agreements during this event. And the common folk consider the All's Meet a time of celebration, and it is celebrated with all sorts of festivities, like gift-giving ceremonies, feasts, and concerts among the populace. In the ancient past, the tribal ancestors of the Raveni adhered to a pantheistic religion, claiming that the earth, nature, and even the universe itself was a part of a divine entity. The cosmos and God are one and the same thing, and many Raveni still subscribe to this school of thought instead of the Andrastian Chantry and the Maker. Officially, Ravain is a part of the Orlesian Chantry, with its own Grand Cleric and all the other attributes of an Andrastian nation. The Ravaini royal family, as well as the nobility, are also loyal and faithful members of the Chantry. But this is generally where the influence of the Chantry stops in Ravain. In reality, outside of the capital of Deresmoid, the Chantry have very little influence, and there are very few among the common folk who follows the teachings of the Chant of Light and Andraste. This has created an odd and sometimes quite tense balance between the different religions and ideologies at work in Ravain, and there are cultural compromises that have been made over the years to satisfy many parties. One of these is the Ravaini Circles of Magi. Because of the Ravaini's general acceptance towards magic, in comparison to the rest of the nations under the influence of the Orlesian Chantry, Ravaini circles work almost the same as any other Thedosian circle, with the notable exception that the seers are greatly involved in the circle's business. The seers, from a Chantry point of view, are hedge mages and unlawful apostates, but because of the minuscule influence of the Chantry in the nation, the Circles do not hunt down the Seers, but instead lets them roam free and gives them access to the Circle Towers. The Circle also allows the Seers to take female mages as their apprentices and teach them to become Seers themselves, as tradition dictates. The Seers are allowed this general freedom from persecution on the condition that they always cooperate and aid the country's Templars, when it is required of them. Ravaini circles are also less strict than other circles on the continent, letting the parents of the mages inside, as well as families and loved ones, visit and mix freely with them as they see fit. Another reason for the Ravaini's reluctance to join the Chantry is due to the nation's history with the Kunari and the Kuhn. During the Kunari Wars, Ravain was occupied by the Kunari forces, and a large portion of the Ravaini population were converted to the Kuhn. Even after the war's end, many Ravaini had become fervent believers in the faith of Ashkari Koslun, and refused to turn back to the faith of the Maker, leading to fierce tensions between the two groups. After the Lomeran Accords, only one enclave of the Kunari were permitted to remain on mainland Thedas, and this was the port city of Kont Ar in Ravain. Today, Kont Ar and the village of Vindar house the section of the Ravaini population that have decided to join or already live under the rule of the Kuhn. The pantheistic faith of many traditional Ravaini people and the all-encompassing structure of the Kuhn being quite similar in certain ways, 
might be why many Raveni decide to join the Kunari, or it is the reason they are not as hostile towards them as other Thedosians. Another cultural facet that makes the Raveni more positively inclined towards the Kuhn might be their views on wealth and communal cooperation. The people of Ravain do not put much stock in aspirations of accumulation of wealth for personal or individual gain, despite being a nation that engage and benefits greatly from trade. Instead, many Ravaini puts the group in front of the individual, and both promotes and engages in efforts of community welfare. Communities not only work to keep their own group well fed and kept, but also work together with other communities to survive offering supplies and other tools if another group is struggling that year or are falling behind. Whether this collectivist thinking is a result of the previous Kunari occupation, or if it has its roots in the old tribal traditions of the Raveni, one can easily see how this way of thinking would make the teachings of the Kunari and the Kun somewhat desirable, if not at least tolerable, by the average Raveni. Kunari emissaries can even be seen in many Raveni settlements and minor cities throughout the nation. The Kunari know better than to try and sway the country's nobility, but many common people, and even seers, have decided to leave their old lives behind and seek a perceived better life among the Kuns faithful in the north. With a majority of the nation bordered by water, Seafaring is a natural part of Raveni life, whether this is for legitimate reasons, like trading and traveling, or illegal ones. Many major cities of Ravain are port cities and have easy access to the sea, but since Ravain is one of the more far-flung nations of the continent, coupled with the fact that law and order, especially Chantry law, often only reaches to the edge of the capital's walls, there is an abundance of pirates and raiders that call Ravain home. The close proximity to the island of Lomeren, a haven for criminals and pirates, only adds to this piracy problem. Many aspiring Ravaini pirates on Lomeren join the Felicissima Armada, or the Raiders of the Waking Sea, as they are more commonly known, a loose confederation of pirates, criminals, and raiders. Other seafaring groups, like the Lords of Fortune Guild, dabble in all kinds of exploits on the high seas. They are famed dungeoneers and treasure hunters from Ravain, that can be hired to recover lost treasures both above and below the waves. They might even pursue certain monster bounties if the pay is good, and for an added cost of course, offer protection for those employers that dare to follow them on their daring quests. They are known to take illegal contracts, however, now and then, stealing from wealthy collectors that might have items and treasures that they want to get their hands on. Often dressed in a colorful and extravagant fashion, some Lords of Fortune learns how to disguise themselves and change their accents so as to better perform whatever mission they might face. To wear the treasures that they have salvaged or found is also a common tradition for members of the guilds, but this may only be done if the Lord of Fortune in question have survived more than a year in the guild. There are several famous individuals from Ravain whose names are known in the rest of Thedas, with the exception of certain historical figures, like Queen Asha Campana, whom I will get to shortly. Here are a few individuals that you might know of that can trace their heritage back to Ravain. First, we have Duncan of the Grey Wardens, Warden Commander of Ferelden during the time of the Fifth Light. This man, who played a central part not only during the time of King Marek Theron, but also during the start of the Fifth Blight, introducing the future hero of Ferelden to the Grey Wardens, is actually half Ravaini. Duncan's mother, Tayana, was from Ravain, while his father, Aaron, was a Ferelden man of Tevinter heritage. Then, we of course have the equally famous and infamous Captain Isabella, pirate, smuggler, admiral, and self-proclaimed Queen of the Eastern Seas. This woman, who not only stole the sacred tome of Kosloon from the Kunari, but also became one of the companions of Hawk, the champion of Kirkwall, is also from Mervain. As is Vivienne de Fer, first enchanter of Montsimard, 
and companion to the Inquisitor. Both of Vivian's parents were merchants from the Raveni capital of Dersmoid. It has been said about Ravain that the nation with its patchwork of cultures remains one entity through consensus and compromise. And from what I have told all of you up until this point, this might be quite a poignant way to summarize the nation culturally. But what about historically? What in broad strokes has befallen the Raveni people throughout its long history? This is what we will learn about now. The summarized history of Ravain. The ancestors of the Ravaini people lived on the sprawling islands of the Boeric Ocean in ancient times. From here, many of them would migrate to what is now the nation of Ravain, presumably during the same time that the other Neromenian tribes of humans started their larger migration onto mainland Thedas. Here, they settled the land in tribal communities, and would eventually become known as the Ravaini people. In time, however, the Ravaini would be brutally subjugated and conquered, like most of the rest of Thedas, by the Tevinter Imperium. After the conquest of the Arlathan Forest, the Imperium expanded massively across northern Thedas, and by the time of Archon Almadrius' reign during the minus 700s ancient, Ravain was firmly a part of the Tevinter realm. The first blight, minus 395 to minus 203 ancient, would ravage the Tevinter Imperium, however, and would have destroyed it had it not been for the creation of the Grey Wardens, and the victory at the Battle of the Silent Plains, after almost 200 years of bloody conflict. The Ravaini would actually play a significant part in the final defeat of the Darkspawn Horde at the Battle of the Silent Plains, as a significant part of the army that the Grey Wardens had gathered for this battle was made up of Ravaini tribesmen and soldiers. They played an honorable and courageous part in stopping the Darkspawn and ending the First Blight. In the aftermath of the First Blight and the death of Andraste, several parts of the eastern and southern continent began to consider breaking off from the Tevinter Imperium and gain independence due to one reason or another. Some wanted to take advantage of the weakened state the Imperium was in. Others favoured secession out of fears that Archon Hesarian's successor, Orentius, would reinstitute the faith of the Old Gods. These sentiments would reach their boiling point in minus 120 ancient, when a full-scale rebellion broke out among the Ravaini tribes against the Imperium. Knowing that Tevinter would clamp down hard with military force to crush this rebellion, several city-states in the Eastern Free Marshes came to the rebellion's aid. With the help of their allies, the Ravaini fought fiercely against the Imperium's forces to gain their freedom and after many years of struggle and conflict, they would finally achieve their goals. At the Battle of Temerin in minus 53 Ancient, the Tevinter military suffered a disastrous defeat, which ultimately led to the Imperium abandoning all of their holdings in Eastern Thedas. And nine years after this momentous victory, the fully independent Kingdom of Ravain was founded in minus 44 Ancient, as many other nations and city-states followed suit in the years after. As the centuries and ages came and went, the Kingdom of Ravain established itself as one of the continent's major nations, with a unique tribal culture that has already been discussed. And although the Chant of Light and the Chantry would spread its influence across most of Thedas, the teachings of Andraste and the Maker's Word would never take root in the nation in the same way that it did in other parts of the continent. The traditions of the seers, along with other local traditions, were too strong in the country that only a few people in comparison converted to the new faith in Ravain over the years. A worthy quick mention in the overall history of Ravain is without a doubt the woman known as the Queen Mother of Thedas, Asha Subira Bahadur. Later Asha Kampana was a Ravaini princess from the city of Aisley. Born in 430 Black, she would later marry the prince of the neighbouring country of Antiva and become one of the most influential political figures in Thedosian history. 
due in no small part to the tactical marriage alliances she established between her family and the rest of the Theodosian nobility. Since Asha Campana is more of a historical figure in Antivan history, her story will therefore be elaborated in our next lesson on Antiva. But her mention here, as originally hailing from Ravain, is more than relevant to the subject at hand. During its long history, Ravain would sadly not be spared the ravages of the Darkspawn and the later Blights. The Fourth Blight broke out in the neighbouring nation of Antiva in the year 512 Exalted, taking the nation completely by surprise and quickly spreading to Ravain, where it caused enormous damage to the nation and its people. Spreading south and west, the Blight was finally pushed back by the armies of the continent and the Grey Wardens after 12 years of fighting. At the Ravani city of Aisley, the Blight was finally ended in a climactic battle where the Archdemon Andoral was finally slain in 524 Exalted. When the Kunari made themselves known in Thedas and launched an invasion of the northern part of the continent in 632 Steel, Ravain was one of the nations first conquered by the Horned Ones. During the course of the Kunari Wars and the Exalted Marches that became a part of the conflict, Ravain would find itself in its centre. Due to the strained relations between the Ravaini people and the Chantry in general, and maybe due to their cultural emphasis on the collective before the individual, matching with the philosophy of the Kuhn, a large portion of the Ravaini population willingly converted to the Kunari cause, becoming Vidathari. This contentment and willingness to convert to the new faith would cause problems for Ravain down the line, sadly. During the following Storm Age, three consecutive exalted marches would be launched by the Chantry against the Kunari, with one of the main purposes to retake Ravain and bring the people back into the Maker's Fold. The war would cause a tremendous loss of life among the Ravaini population. So many Ravaini civilians were killed in the conflict, in fact, that in 784 Storm, when the exhausted Thedosian forces had finally managed to push the Kunari back to the port city of Kont Ar in northern Ravain, it was the horrible amount of civilian casualties in Kont Ar and Ravain that finally brought the Kunari to the negotiating table not the Kunari's military losses, which had seemingly been minor in comparison. As the Lomeran Accords were signed in 784 Storm, the war came to an end, and the Kunari moved back to Parvolan as per the treaty. The Chantry, along with nationalistic forces in Ravain, began the task of converting the Ravaini of the North back to Andrastianism, this would not work as well as they had hoped, however, as the vast majority of the Ravaini who had converted were more than happy to remain as Vidithari and a part of the Kunari. These converts also refused to leave for the island of Parvolan, like the rest of the de facto Kunari had done, as per the peace treaty, but were content to stay in what would essentially become the Kuhn's enclave on the mainland, Kont Ar. This would, regrettably, result in their opposition, when words failed them, taking up the sword instead and starting to purge the non-believers. Countless civilian converts, men, women and children from northern Ravain and Kont Ar, were butchered mercilessly and buried in mass graves. To this day, it is still a mystery as to why the converted leaders of Kont Ar did not send for help to their Kunari allies on Parvolan against the Chantry at this point, which would probably have started the war all over again. This event is a blemish on Ravaini history, and the memory of it lives with the citizens of the country to this very day. Today, Ravain is a nation set apart from the rest of the continent, in large part due to the cultural and societal aspects that I have covered. Yet even so, it is still a nation with considerable influence, especially at sea, with numerous trade routes reaching far and wide. One event in modern Ravaini history is especially worth mentioning, however, as it pertains to the Mage Templar War, a conflict that will be discussed in future lectures. 
in 940 Dragon, at the start of the conflict between the mages and the Templars of the continent, a group of Seekers, the Chantry Secret Police, were sent from the Ravani city of Aisley to the capital of Dersmoid to investigate the state of the city's Circle Magi. This relatively small circle, existing mostly as a facade to appease the Ravani Chantry, had adopted many of the local Ravani traditions in regards to magic. This included seers freely visiting the circle and training female mages in their special arcane ways, as well as the circle letting the families of the mages visit the tower freely and without restrictions. The seekers were shocked by the unorthodox ways of these mages and pronounced all members of the circle to be apostates, returning soon after with a small army of Templars. The mages of the Dersmoid Circle would not let themselves be intimidated, however, and put up a strong defense against the attacking forces. Initially meeting with success in repelling the Templars, the Dersmoid mages might even have been victorious in this battle, had it not been for the drastic measures that were taken by the Templars. Invoking the Rite of Annulment, the action that allows for the destruction of an entire circle including everyone and everything in it, the attacking Templars gave no quarter and went on a rampage. Walls were torn down, artifacts destroyed, libraries were deemed tainted and burned, and lowly apprentices were cut down without mercy. The remaining mages barricaded themselves and sent word of the atrocity to other mages around the continent, but eventually, the advancing Templars broke through and killed the remaining mages down to the last member. The Dersmoid Circle was completely destroyed. On that rather sad note, we will end today's lecture on the nation of Ravain. Relevant literature will mostly be Genetivi and Petrine, but be sure to check out some local sources and Kunari scriptures as well for some nuance. Next time, we will take a closer look at Ravain's neighbor, the Principality of Antifa. Until then, I have been Professor Absalom, and I will see you all in the next lesson. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoy the content, be sure to subscribe, like, comment, and check out the other videos on the channel. More interesting lore videos will be coming in the future, so keep an eye out. Thank you once again, and until next time, have a good one.